Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We are living in exciting times. May I say to you that we are living in very significant times. Why is that? When we look at this world prophetically, listening to what the prophets said, what Messiah himself taught, what we learn from the apostles, we see something. We see the end in the horizon. And this is a very important word that I'm going to speak on in a few minutes. This word, end. And the reason why it's important is because Messiah himself, when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, he emphasized the word end. So we'll talk about that. But why is this exciting time? Why is this significant? Because we see things that are going on. I was asked a question not too long ago, and that is, do I expect to see Messiah's return? Talking in specific terms of the blessed hope and the rapture. I'm 56 years old, and a normal life expectancy tells me that if all goes normally, and it usually does not, I have approximately 24 years left. And I believe that the events of the last times are so close that it will be brought to an end, this world, prior to the time that I die. Now, that is my belief, and there's a basis for that. And that is what we see today going on. See, we need to allow the Word of God to speak to us, but be careful, because we don't know the day or the hour. And things can get very close, but then prolonged. No, it is very dangerous for people to give dates, times, and such. But I do believe that when we look at what's going on today, we see things moving to a, a point of, of climax, of conclusion based upon what the scripture says. But here's what I want you to hear. Because what started all of this is the time that we're living in when this video's being made. The unique times, the corona times. And I say that because the world has changed so rapidly. Not just here or there, this nation or this area, but almost the entire world is experiencing the same things. We've talked to friends in Singapore. We've talked to friends in Australia. We've talked to friends throughout Europe, throughout North America, South America, Central America, all over. And they are experiencing the same thing. We said, what, what can you do? What can't you do? It's the same thing, more or less, all over. Now, what I want to emphasize is this. We need to realize that there are prophetic events that have to happen that tells us where we are on the prophetic calendar. And when we look at the coronavirus, is it a last day event in the sense of this? Is it something that tells us that we are in the last seven years? We are not. Does it tell us that we are in the, the time, and we'll focus in on this in a few minutes, that Yeshua called the birth pains, the time of sorrows? We can be for sure that the birth pains, they had not began in any serious way. 
But here's what I want you to hear. There are things that tell us that we are moving towards that. Things are converging to those birth pains. Now, why am I so sure that the coronavirus isn't a last day event or an event relating to the birth pains? Because I've read what Messiah said. You look, for example, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. He teaches in these three different Gospels this message of the last days. And when he says the birth pains, he says that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Now, there's conflicts going on today. There are some wars happening, but, but I strongly see in the message of Yeshua that these wars are going to be much more significant. But not just wars, it says also that one ethnic group is going to rise up against another ethnic group. Now, some will say one nation against another nation. But if you check that Greek word, it's where we get the English word ethnic. So there's going to be one ethnic group rising up against another. This is happening today, not in the degree that it will. And then the scripture says there's going to be famines. Well, there are some shortages of food in different places, but not to the degree that we would have to conclude that we're in the birth pains. And then he says that there will be pestilence. Now, the word in Greek, loi moi, is in the plural. So there has to be pestilences. That is many of these. Now, here's what I want to say. When I look at the coronavirus, what I see is this. I see an event that has much more significance in how the governments are responding to it than the disease itself. Now, this is not to minimize the suffering that people who have had it, what they've went through, can be most frightful, very painful, great discomfort. And we know that many people have died because of it. And it's certainly not my heart, my desire to minimize that, to trivialize that. It's significant from a family standpoint. But what's more of a prophetic significance is how we see governments responding to it. And one of the ways that they're responding to it is, is throwing a lot of money. And what's going to happen when there's famines, when there's earthquakes, when there's wars, and additional plagues and pestilence coming? More intense, more frequent, stronger in the number of people they kill. What's going to happen at that time? See, that's what the birth pains speak to. How, how would I summarize the coronavirus? Well, I used to, to run competitively in high school and college. And I can remember this one uh, friend of mine that ran for a, a different school. His last name was Sutton. And we would be running, and he would, throughout the race, he was always up front. He was very good. And he would always just kind of surge. And if people didn't know him, they'd say, is Sutton making his move now? Now, we who knew him knew he wasn't. He was going to surge 8, 10, 12 times in the first two and a half miles or, or four kilometers but it wasn't until that, that last kilometer, a little bit less, that he would make his true move. What was that like? Well, these other surges early on, they were just preparing things for that final move. Now, Messiah talked about birth pains. We're going to speak more about that in a moment. These wars and rumors of war, ethnic group rising up against one ethnic group, a kingdom against a kingdom, famines, disease, earthquakes, all of this. And what we find here is Messiah says, these are the birth pains. 
Well, my wife has been pregnant several times, and she, around six or seven months. Now, we didn't know this the first pregnancy, but, but she would start having kind of little labor pains, six months, seven months. They're called Braxton headaches. They are known as false labor. Now, unless you're pregnant, you're not going to have them. And they show that things are moving along, but they're not the labor yet. Don't, don't run to the hospital. Don't get everything ready because these are just, just paving the way. They're, they're showing changes that are happening. That's the coronavirus. Now, if we were seeing World War III, if we were seeing plague after plague, disease after disease, earthquake after earthquake, and earthquakes are increasing, but we're talking about major earthquakes and famine in many places throughout the globe, and also an increase in persecution of believers, then, then I would say, yes, we're in that, that time known as the beginning of the sorrows, the birth pains, but we are not there yet. But are we in the last days in a, a very broad understanding of that? Yes. Now, why do I say that? Well, in this broad use, there's other signs. And these signs are happening today. Not to the fullest extent, but they're beginning. And let me give you one of them initially. And that is we, based upon Daniel chapter 8, we should see in that scripture, which three times the prophet Daniel says, this is a vision for the last days, the end times, for the bringing about the end of God's wrath. Daniel says this, that there's going to be a beast. He calls it a ram. And this ram, a beast in prophetic terms, is an empire is going to rise up, and it's going to be, and he specifies. He calls it Paras Umidai, which is Persian and the Medes, or modern-day Iran. And we can anticipate, and we're seeing the formation of that now in our days. We see that Iran is rising. It's spreading out. It's growing in influence. We see its influence in Iraq in Syria, in Lebanon, growing now in Jordan, also in Yemen, and also in, in Gaza, and in Judea and Samaria, what the world calls the West Bank. So Iran is, is expanding, but Iran is not the empire of the Antichrist. No, we see there that Iran, this confederacy of, of several nations, are going to move westward to the north, to the south, and cause havoc, despair, death, suffering. It is going to be of great significance. It hasn't happened yet. And it says that as it does so, two things are going to be defined. First of all, a sense of hopelessness, helplessness among those that are, are being dominated by Iran as they expand. And the second thing is that they say, en matzil, meaning the world looks, there's no savior. There's no one to deliver them. And as they are saying this, hopelessness, no savior, what happens? Daniel says, suddenly, without expectation, there's going to be another beast. This is called the goat, sometimes the shaggy goat. This empire is going to rise out of Europe. And it is going to put down this Iranian-led coalition, this confederacy. And here's what we know. The Antichrist is going to come from Europe, from this goat. This is undebatable. The scripture is clear because it uses a term in describing where this, this empire is going to rise up from, 
he uses the term Yavan, which back then meant Europe, that area. Today, it's a term that we use for Greece because the Greece empire ruled over Europe at the time that, that this was, was being, being prophesied, prophesied. Now, what I mean by that is Daniel spoke long before, long before the Greek empire rose up. But they used the term that was known for that Greek European empire in the days of Daniel. And it became known in our modern Hebrew for the nation of Greece today. But it's a European uh, uh, term. So has that happened yet? No. Iran is growing, but it hasn't started that in any clear, discernible way. That other empire hasn't rise to put it down. So that's why I say, now that the coronavirus is happening because these things haven't happened, we're not in the birth pangs or even in the immediate time leading up to it. But that doesn't mean we're not close. That we're not in that general last day framework in a very broad and general sense. Why? There's other signs that we are told. Messiah says in that same discussion from Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, he tells us of other things. One is to watch the fig tree. What's that? Israel. And when Israel, like a fig tree, begins to, to flourish, sends forth its shoots, blossoms, then you know, it says, summer is near. Well, the word summer in Hebrew is ketz. Now, I realize this was written in Greek, but they were probably speaking Hebrew. And the word summer is kites. And the word ketz is end. It's a play on words. So he says, when you see Israel flourishing like Israel is today, back as a nation, a strong nation, an economic powerhouse, Israel is flourishing. That tells me something. Now, there's other signs as well. We know in the last days that what is good is going to be called evil. And what is evil, what God says is an abomination, is going to be called good. We're seeing this. We also know that Paul says there's going to be a falling away. Now, have we reached that? No, but we're laying the foundation for that, that great apostasy. We see that there's great theological air in, in the church today within the doctrines of Christianity. Churches are embracing things that they ought not to embrace. Worship is growing corrupt. All of these are signs that we are converging upon the last days. But have we entered into formally with a capital E and a capital T the last days, either those birth pains and the last seven years? We have not. I expect to see that in my lifetime. But we are not there yet. And can I say, I promise you, before the next 25 years, this will come to an end? No. We see sometimes things stop and go on. And then it begins again. But it's my strong opinion. What I see, that things are converging, leading up to, coming to, these last days in a formal, more specific way, those birth pains and the last days. So remember that. Remember that. Now I want to take the last few minutes of this video and ask you some questions and deal with some events and terms and such that will lay the foundation for the next two videos that will follow in this these, uh, series of the last days as we are all in quarantine and such in our homes and, and like. So as people are thinking about the last days, I thought it would be good to, to deal with the last days. Now, one of the questions that I frequently receive is what about the 144,000? Mentioned in Revelation chapter seven and chapter 14. It's an interesting, interesting passage of Scripture, those two chapters, and a very, very significant uh, uh, event. 
Now, we know in Revelation chapter 7, all we're told is this, that these this 144,000 are going to be sealed, and they're going to be sealed, and there are 12,000 for each of the 12 tribes, but Dan is not mentioned there, but the tribe of Manasseh replaces Dan. That's all we're told about them, and that they're sealed before the wrath of God falls. Now, what you hear many people say is this. You hear people say that these are 144 Jewish evangelists. There's one very uh, popular Bible teacher in, in America, in California, and I respect him very much. But, but I heard him say something that was troubling. And that is that these 144,000, they're Jewish evangelists that are going to bring about, and I, I quote, the greatest spiritual awakening ever known. Those were his words. Now, I want to ask you, the listener, two questions in regard to that. We're going to deal in a separate video with the 144,000. But I just want to ask you a question, and that's this. Show me the biblical passage that says that these 144,000 are Jewish evangelists. Are they Jewish? Yes, they are. Are they evangelists? I know nowhere in the scripture this is said. I know the inference that they use a passage in Revelation 7 and 1 in Joel, but it doesn't go along with it. And I'm writing an article as I record this video on the 144,000, which will be more specific in dealing with these things. But there is no verse that clearly says these 144,000 Jewish men are in fact evangelists and that they are going to bring about a great spiritual awakening. Don't see that in the scripture. Correct me if I'm wrong. Share with me that verse of scripture. Now I know what people say in the verses they give, but it does not say that they're evangelists. It does not speak about some great spiritual awakening that's going to take place. In fact, when we look at the tribulation period, and let me say that, that everyone agrees that, that, that believes in these 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Now, I believe in the 144,000, but I do not believe that they're evangelists because the Word of God doesn't say that. This is something that's inferred. It is something that is rationalized. It is based upon one's logic rather than, and the Bible warns about leaning on your own understanding, rather than any clear scriptural verse. So send me that verse, and, and I'll read it. I'll confess my error. If you want, I'll give your name that you were the one that set me straight. Be happy to do that. But I don't see any scripture that clearly says that. Now, there's another thing. When we look at that last seven years, that final 70th week, now, this is what Daniel prophesied. He prophesied 70 weeks. And a week, biblically, prophetically, it's not seven days, but seven years. And we see here that, that these seven years, I do not see a great spiritual awakening for the nations. Now, will Israel, a good portion a large remnant come to faith in the last days at the very end? Yes, but not through any proclamation of 144,000 Jewish evangelists. In fact, the one who's going to be proclaiming during this time is not the 144,000, but we have two others. One, if you look at Revelation 14, the one who takes the gospel is an angel that's what the scripture says, not the 144,000. Read Revelation 14 carefully. We'll deal with this in our video about this in the article. But just tuck this away. It's the angel, likewise. The second one is really two, the two witnesses that speak to Israel. No, I do not see anywhere 
in the scripture. That those last seven years are a time of great spiritual awakening. In fact, just the opposite is said. Why is that? Well, Paul speaks about God and the fullness of the Gentiles. That God has blinded Israel for a season, partially. And that he's turned the gospel to the nations. But when the fullness of the gospel, fullness of the Gentiles enter in, when that happens, he's going to turn his attention back to Israel. That's what happens, especially in those last three and a half years. The emphasis is upon Israel. Secondly, when we look at the trumpet judgments and the bold judgments that really speak to the wrath of God, what we find is this. This wrath is falling upon the nations. And it says that they did not three verses, one for the trumpet, two for the bowls. Three verses says they did not turn from their wickedness. And it gives a list of different sinful things. Idolatry, thievery, blasphemy, sexual immorality, idolatry, murder. It says they would not turn from these things, would not turn from their gods of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood. They would not repent. Here again, show me the verse that says that there's going to be a great spiritual awakening among the Gentiles in the, the last seven years that are going to be led by those 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Now, this is what I hear. There's that wonderful person. I believe he is a terrific individual. And he has videos on this. And he espouses that. But it's not biblically sound. It is not correct. It is not supported by a biblical text. Now, what do we see? Well, we see this. We are going to emphasize a promise. That's what we see and perceive. And that's this. Revelation, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9. What an important verse for the last days for believers. In fact, it's addressed to believers. He tells us here that God has not appointed you as a believer, someone who has received personally that gospel message, that saving message of Messiah Yeshua who died upon that cross, who shed his blood. We receive him, that gospel, and he says, you have not been appointed for wrath, but to obtain salvation. When we look at the passage of Scripture that deals with the blessed hope, the rapture, it says the blessed hope is this, that we are going to be removed, taken from this world prior to, prior to the wrath of God falling. Read Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Let me share with you in clear terms something about the rapture. And that is this, when Paul speaks, he tells us, I don't want you to be ignorant. He says, when Messiah returns, now this is not his second coming. Talk about that in a moment. But when Messiah returns, and this time in the blessed hope, the rapture, he's coming, but not all the way to Jerusalem. That's the second coming. No, when he comes in the blessed hope, the rapture, He's just coming into the sky. And it says, the dead in Messiah, now it's not speaking about their souls. It's talking about their bodies that have been buried, wherever they might be. It says, the dead in Christ will rise first. What does that mean? Their bodies. Where is their souls, the real, the essence of them? The Bible says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Remember what Messiah said to that, that thief on the cross today who repented. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Wasn't 
asleep, but rather he was cognitive. And Messiah says, at the time of the rapture, the dead in Christ, their bodies that have decayed, that are ashes, doesn't matter what, with God all things are possible. He is going to recreate in a new way, in a glorious way, a kingdom body for every dead believer. And that body is going to come together perfectly in its new form, its kingdom form, its glorious form. And it is going to rise and it is going to meet with their souls who are surrounding Yeshua in the air. And they're going to be reunited, new body, with their soul. When a person dies, their soul, if they're a believer, goes into the kingdom of heaven to be with Messiah. Those who are still alive, it's probably you and me, if we're still alive when that happens, then we are going to see in a fraction of a second, a twinkling of an eye, in a blink of an eye, we are going to see our bodies transformed upon us into that same glorious state like those others. And we are going to rise up, both our new body and our soul, together to be with him. And we'll be in the heaven until the second coming. Now let me share with you that there is a difference between the rapture and the second coming. I want to give you a clear sign. We'll talk more about this in a video dealing with the rapture, but realize this. The sign of the rapture, and there's other things, but the sign is the moon and the sun. The sun turns dark, but the moon turns red like blood. Why? Remember 1 Thessalonians 5, 9? Our blessed hope is we're not going to experience the wrath of God. We're not appointed to wrath. So before the wrath of God falls, and what announces God's wrath? That great and terrible day of God's wrath, the day of the Lord. It is going to be announced by the sun turning dark and the moon turning red. There's other cosmetic events, but those are the big ones. Sun turning dark, the moon turning red. That is the sign of, if you go to Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 12 and following, that same thing happens there in Revelation 6. The sun turns dark. The moon turns red like blood before. The wrath of the Lamb is poured out. Did you hear that? The wrath of the Lamb being poured out on this world. So before his wrath comes, the rapture has to happen. That is a promise. We'll talk more about that in a different video in the next week or so. But the sign for the second coming, it's similar, but there's difference. You look, for example, in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 29 and 30. We have that sign. It says, similarly, the sun is going to turn dark as sackcloth. And the moon is also going to not give its light. It's going to be dark as well. See the difference? Rapture, sun dark, moon red like blood. Second coming, sun dark, but the moon is also going to be dark. Two different events and two different signs that, that point them out. So we can be very, very precise. So I want us to be individuals that understand the word of God. Now, the last thing I want to deal with before we close is this whole issue of the last seven years being called a tribulation period. I have no problem with that. It is a tribulation period. But here's the question challenging you. What is the verse of Scripture that says those last seven years are all a time of God's wrath falling upon the world? Until God's wrath falls, begins to fall, we should have no expectation as believers that the rapture is going to take place. Read Titus 2.13. Read 1 Thessalonians 5.9. It clearly says our expectation is we are not appointed for wrath. There is no verse, 71, that, that, that you can find 
that says specifically those last seven years is all the time of God's wrath. No, it's tribulation. And we should expect tribulation and persecution. God's never promised us that we won't go through tribulation. In fact, Acts chapter 14, verse 22 says, it's necessary to go through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. Very interesting verse. And then when someone says, but we'll be gone before the tribulation, simply not factual from a biblical perspective. We won't go through God's wrath, but we will experience, and believers are today, it's increasing. It's a sign that we're coming close. Persecution of believers are increasing, but it's going to be much, much, much worse. Just like the plagues are going to be much, much, much worse. And the earthquakes, more intense, much more intense. And the famines, more, more intense and more prevalent. That's what the Word of God says. So we need to be individuals who are wise, who base our beliefs on not what we hear, but upon the authority of this Bible that has no heirs whatsoever. So there is no verse that says all seven years is a time of God's wrath being poured out. Now, when I've challenged people, this is their comeback. They don't give me a verse of scripture. They say, well, look at these events in the last seven years. Are they not horrible, Baruch? I said, yes, they're horrible. I mean, can you imagine any other cause from them than God? So yes, I can. It's satanic. It shows the wickedness of humanity and the, the evilness and also the power of Satan. Now, God's power is greater. Satan has already been defeated, but he is going to bring about horrible things in this world. And we're called to be overcomers. Isn't that what he tells the church seven times in Revelation chapters 2 and 3? Be overcomers. And then we're led to believe that's it. No. Understand what the scripture's telling us. No verse that says all seven years is a time of God's wrath. One more question. And that is this. You hear in this friend who I respect, he says all the time, the church age ends prior to those final seven years. And I've said to him, different friend, I've said to him, what is your justification for that? Now, I know what he's going to say. I've read the books. I've heard the other people teach it. But it's illogical from a biblical standpoint. It's rational. This is what they say. Well, read Daniel chapter 9. It says here there's, there's prophecy of those 70 weeks, right? Said, yeah, I'm familiar with that. And the first 69 has ended. Do you agree? I said, yes, I agree with that. Was the church there? No, it wasn't. There it goes. If the church wasn't in the first 69, it's impossible for them to be in the 70th. Really? That is factual? Let me give you an example. True story. A few months ago, I met a man, and we became friends and met him and his wife, and he invited us over to their home for his birthday party, his 68th birthday party. Now, I want to tell you something. I wasn't at his birthday party the year before, the 67th, or the year before that, the 67th. I've never been to one of his birthday parties. But just because I had not been to the first 67 doesn't mean I can't go to the 68th and hopefully the 69th and he lives many, many more years until the Lord calls him. So the point of this, you cannot say, it's not biblical proof to say, well, the church that didn't exist in the first 69 weeks can't be in the 70th because they didn't exist for the 69. It's simply not a satisfactory answer. It doesn't really make sense. Why? Well, this is what I've read. This is what I've been taught. This is what I've heard. And that's not Bible study. The Word of God admonishes you. And I want to get very, very serious and direct right now. If you 
call yourself a disciple of Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, and you are not diligently studying this Bible, there's a big disconnect. If you believe things that aren't written here, that is extremely dangerous spiritually, physically, both in this lifetime and in the age to come. No, when we walk in the Spirit, we're going to be taught truth. That's what Messiah promises in the book of John. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth, a spirit of righteousness. Those two things, well, do they go together, truth and righteousness. So we have to stop just believing these little uh, bumper stickers that says, I'm not waiting for the Antichrist, I'm waiting for the real Christ. I am too. But the scripture is going to surprise you what it says to believers about the work of the Antichrist and the coming and the revealing of the Antichrist. No, let me conclude with this. So there's no misunderstanding. Are the last days, those birth pains and the final seven years, are they close? I truly believe they are. Are we in that period of time now? We are not. What the scripture says to define them, we're not there. Are things moving, leading, converging to that? I believe that they are. And I believe they are rapidly. But here's my concern. I do not want to be a person that leads people astray and say this coronavirus, it's a last day event. It's not. And if you tell people they are, they are going to expect the end soon. And this is what the message of Messiah is concerning the end. Remember those parables of the ten virgin? The ten virgins, they went out to meet their groom. And notice what it says. He was delayed. I can assure you something, that the church, for the most part, are going to be saying when the events of the last days, those birth pangs begin. They're going to be saying, I thought he was supposed to come. I thought he was supposed to come by now. Why are we going through this? We're not prepared. And let me tell you, what I see from the church in light of the coronavirus, I'm not very optimistic about how they're going to do, we're going to do, when, when times really get tough. Are we going to demonstrate our faith? Are we going to put things in the right perspective? Are we going to stand up for, for Messiah Yeshua? Are we going to defy the desires of the Antichrist and fulfill the desires of the true Christ? That's the question. And unfortunately, right now, when I look at the church in the broadest sense, I'm not optimistic. But I believe those, those difficult times, those hardships, those trials that are coming are going to strengthen. They will give us a new perspective. They will cause people to look closely at the scripture and stop just listening to people and start studying to show oneself approved. Well, I'm going to stop with this. And in the next few days, there'll be another video put up in regard to the 144,000. There'll be another one put up with some information concerning our blessed hope, the rapture. And there'll be a third one that gives us a brief overview of the last days so that we can know the truth and therefore have the right expectations. Well, shalom from Israel. I look forward to the next time that I have the privilege of sharing with you from this perfect book that God has entrusted to you and to me. Shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. 
Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.